There you go, Scott. All right, ladies and gentlemen. We are uh, back with Wood Chat. We're finally back on with Wood Chat. Sorry for the technical delays, but uh, as you can see, we've got two talking heads and a workbench. <laughs> and uh, oh. Matt, <laughs> Matt will be the talking workbench tonight. And uh, we, Matt, say hi. Hi, everybody. It's Matt from UppercutWoodworks.com. How you doing? And I'm Scott from ScottMakeWoodworks.com. And uh, we don't I'm have Chris. I was going to throw it to you in a second. That's <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, our, uh, we don't have Chris here today, but we do have uh, Mr. Jimmy DeResta, if you haven't checked him out before. Um, definitely check out his videos. and We're going to watch one here in a little bit just to uh, get an idea of what he does. But uh, the, the dude makes some incredible uh, incredible videos on just making stuff. He's a, he's a big name in the maker world, so good to, good to have him on. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's an honor, really. If anybody's ever interested in what I do, it's it's very touching to me. Thank you. And did we just lose your video too, Matt? Do you see his video? Yeah, I see his video. I okay. can see me. All right. It blacked out for me for a second, but um, so I guess let's uh, let's see if we can pull one of these videos up here a second. And uh, someone watching will have to let me know if this works because we haven't actually tried the uh, watch a YouTube video together. But actually, uh, Matt, you might need to do it because you're running the. Sure. So let me put the go ahead and put the link in the um, in the chat room for me. Oh, there it is, right there. It's right in the YouTube uh, uh, thing on the on the left hand side. So. I'm not seeing anything yet. I totally have it now. Not sure I make sure it's visible to everybody. I personally am not seeing it, but I know it. I was there, so <laughs> I don't need to see it. Is it Scott, is it playing? I'm trying to get it to you. Oh, okay. Because I thought you were just watching. It's like, oh. Okay. Matt, is it working for you? I can see it, but I don't think it's not broadcasting to everybody. That's the thing. Okay. We're the symbol of uh, professionalism here, Jimmy. Yeah. Hey, no, this is fine. <laughs> this is the way it is everywhere. I've done a couple TV shows, and this, this is exactly the same. Nobody, you know, is... technology <laughs> changes so quickly that it's just so difficult to keep up with it. That's why when we spoke earlier today about Google+, Plus, I said, I am virtually lost. I have no idea what to do. All right, well, that might not work, so... Well, you guys, in uh, following along, you'll have to take our word for it and check his videos <laughs> out after. But um, he, uh, well, tell us a little bit about him. What got you started doing them, and what kind of things do you like to like to make? Um, well, I I've been making things my whole life. I've literally been hand making things since I was a little kid. I grew up in my dad's wood shop, and uh, I have two brothers, and the three of us all grew up working in the shop. But I was the only one that really took to it the most, and I was the one that would pick my dad's scraps up and fiddle around with the bandsaw and hot glue stuff together, and that so, slowly became all I ever did. Uh, I never really had like a real job other than working in a sign shop. Uh, after high school and in high school, I worked at a sign shop. I was the bandsaw man. I would just get handed letters all day long to cut out, and that's why I'm pretty good on the bandsaw. I mean, I was good when I got the job, because as a child, I always used the bandsaw, and uh, uh, just a quick history. I guess I then I went to in high school. I was in architecture school for three years, and then when I got out of high school, I decided I did not want to be an architect, and I decided to be an artist. So I went to art school instead, and I went to the school of visual arts, and that's when I kind of became a 3D artist. And then right after school, I began making prototypes and developing inventions for the toy business, and all through it, always doing woodwork to some level or another. And uh, I must admit, I mean. I, I never really 
got into the, the so-called art of fine woodworking until I became friends with Nick Offerman. And I actually became friends <laughs> with Nick Offerman before he was famous. <laughs> and oh, really? was a, Yeah. And now uh, he's, uh, you know, obviously Nick's very well known around the world. But Nick has inspired me to kind of take my woodworking up to the next level. And uh, so I really owe it to him. Every once in a while I'll send him a note. Like if I make something that I'm really proud of, I'll say, Nick, thanks for the inspiration. And uh, through it all, I've had a few TV shows here and there. And um, the TV shows come and go so fast without any control from me or my brother. So the last go-around, which was a show called Dirty Money by Discovery Channel, it came and went so fast, my girlfriend encouraged me to just start making videos on YouTube and just develop a, a following on YouTube. And it's something I did here and there in the past, but I, ne I, I never really focused on it. But this time I made a concentrated effort to put videos up at least a few times a, a month. And uh, that was two years ago, and I'm developing a pretty good following. And then, of course, Make Magazine pays me to put up some videos for them. And then uh, some of you guys may have seen my very first video for DeWalt, which was uh, which is a fun one. That was kind of just a test project, and it's up and running now. So, okay. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, i just always been hand-making stuff. Like I said, my brother's I'm the one that took it the furthest. My brother John still makes stuff, but uh, he doesn't make things as elaborately as, as I do. Okay. What uh, what kind of inspired your video stuff? Because anyone that's seen your videos know it, it's definitely got a unique, um, and a unique aspect to it, and oh, you speed you. up different actions, and it's, it's really well, fascinating to watch. Well, people always say to me, "How did you get this TV show? And how did you get that TV show?" Uh, well, I mean, a quick history of my TV stuff is I did a show called Trash the Cash with my brother in 2003, and then that led to a show on on Home and Garden called Hammered, and then that led to Against the Grain, which was a horrible show, and then that led to Dirty Money. But the reason I bring that up is because each one of those TV deals came because I shot a video. I shot my own video of me doing something to to show the TV people that I can actually do this for TV. And uh, and you know they all they were talkies. I, I call them talkies obviously because I'm talking in them. And uh, so. When it came time to, when we sat down and we said, I sat down and I said, I want to make a YouTube channel, I knew that I had to make them quickly, and they weren't going to be as elaborate as all those TV show pitches that I did, because um, those took weeks to edit, because I had a couple of people involved, my brother, for instance, and you know everyone's opinion. Um, so I said, if I'm going to work alone and fast, the very first thing I should do is cut out the audio, because it's just going to take too much to edit the audio. And uh, that was the main reason why I didn't introduce audio, and then... The first couple of videos I posted had a Beastie Boys song in it, and then I immediately got like a notification <laughs> that you're using somebody's copyright. <laughs> and so I said, you know what? No music. <laughs> no. So for simplicity, I cut out the audio of conversation, and for necessity, I cut out the audio of copyright. <laughs> and I just, I, I just was playing around, and I was like, you know what? I just like watching people make stuff on YouTube. I always jump through to the action. But when they're stopping yeah. and standing and talking, I just jump right to when their hands are moving. Mm -hmm. And so that was really, you know, all these things all came together in, in one point. But the big inspiration was just trying to edit simply and quickly. And, uh, and then, again, my own personal attention span is like somewhere around five or six minutes. And so I have the imaginary number of six minutes that I try and stay within. It's nobody's, it's nobody's rule but my own. I mean, I just cut a video. It's going to be about eight minutes. Um, I'm still not even sure if I'm going to post it yet. I might wait a little bit because it's still missing a couple good shots. Um, but on my own channel, I'll go over eight minutes. But for make, I always just try and keep it at six. But if it's really good, like the guitar video, I, I jammed a lot of stuff in there, and I think that's like seven minutes. But yeah, that's it. And uh, you know, and now my mind is really going. I'm always constantly thinking, oh, what could be a good video? What tool could I use for this video? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what could be a good project to make for this video? It's It's been a lot of fun, and it keeps me really thinking. It helps me exercise my inventive mind. Yeah. Somebody... Uh, recognition, which is nice. There you go. Somebody on Twitter says, the sign shop job explains why you were a maestro of the bandsaw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the bandsaw... Actually, a very funny story. I just told it to a fan that asked me some advice. Um, I always have been working to make money for myself, more or less. I mean, like I said, I had a couple of little jobs here and there, but they were all involved in making things. I worked construction with my dad for many years in high, in high school and college. Um, but as a young kids in elementary school, my brothers and I would make signs 
for nameplates for kids, and my dad would draw them, and then we would cut them out on the jigsaw. And when we had the inside of a letter, we would drill the hole. So it was all bubble letters, and uh, we would charge 25 cents a letter. And the funny thing is, is now that John and I have gotten some exposure on national TV, friends of mine from elementary school from literally 40 years ago, I guess I was about 10 years old when we started making those signs, so that's about 36, 37 years ago. People ha still have these nameplates that say their name that would sit, you know, all, all bubble letters cut out on a jigsaw, on an old rock roll jigsaw that we used to have. And uh, so that was the first experience with making things for money and also cutting things out on a jigsaw bandsaw. And me and my brothers made hundreds of those through like 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th grade. So it was a funny start. And then I got the sign job, which was you know, a natural progression. I started learning about typefaces. You started learning about what? I'm sorry. Uh, typefaces and uh, okay. typology. Topography. Topography. That's <laughs> a topology. <laughs> Excellent. I like maps too, though. What uh, what's your favorite video that you made? Um, well, uh, my most successful video is uh, by far the the guitar video, because I made that for Wyclef, and you know Wyclef's obviously a national international celebrity, so it got some recognition simply because of his name, and uh, then. It's just it just show and I'm one of one of the things I'm most proud of is my bandsaw technique, and I get to show it off in that quite a bit. Um, so that that's another thing I'm kind of proud of is uh, my ability to to play with the bandsaw and to carve wood, and uh, then that, that also has a little bit of mechanics in it when I got the inspiration to make the trigger the whammy bar. So it has a lot of the uh, you know it has a lot of cross references of the things that I like to show off. So it's a good that's, that's Wyclef's guitar. Does he play it play it and show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, absolutely, he does. He, uh, you know, obviously he's trying to make a political statement with it, and um, that's how uh, I came to make it for him. He, he, a lot of people, if you notice a lot of the comments, people say he, he knocked off Peter Tosh, and he actually did it intentionally. He knew that Peter Tosh used to carry a M16 in the Vietnam era, and, uh, you know, to kind of, like, just show, like, how ludicrous it is to carry guns or whatever. I mean, you could interpret it a million ways. But he wanted to carry a, a more modern version of you know what our generation thinks of as a gun or a rifle, and so we, we came to to choose the AK-47, and then somebody in his crew said, "Oh, let's make it like uh, Saddam's gold AK-47," and that's how we ended up making it gold. So I mean, a funny story with that is I, I was like kind of partway through the build, we had had a conversation about it, and I was partway through the build, and I brought it in to show him. I was also partway through the movie, so before I actually opened up the crate to show him his the contact that got us together said, you got to see the movie first. So they played the partially edited movie because it wasn't, the guitar was not completed. And he freaked out. And as soon as I opened it up, everybody in the studio was grabbing at it, wanting to touch it. And uh, it was uh, it was actually, it was a real proud moment of mine. And uh, he said, I have a video shoot in two days. This has to be there. It has to be done in the next two days. And I was like, uh, I don't uh, I don't even think it had the whammy bar in it yet. And so for the next two days, I went home and I made those little clips of the video. And I mean, honestly, that's why I ended up spray painting it with a can of gold spray paint because I just didn't have the means to get it to like a, a spray house and get it sprayed properly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's all good and well anyway because the thing is obviously physically abused because everybody wants to touch it. Everybody wants to take a picture with it. And so yeah. when you see it up close, uh, you know, the corners are all worn off and everything. It, it, even if, if I spent $500 on a good paint job, it would be destroyed by now. Yeah. yeah. So the few times I got it back, I, I was able to touch up the paint with the same can of paint. So it's, yeah. it's actually a good thing. And it looks great in photographs, which is the main thing. And it actually really does yeah. play very well. So. Excellent. I don't play it very well, but he plays it very well. <laughs> you, you guys hacked up a real AK-47 to do that? No, actually, uh, it's a little misleading in the video when you watch it. I had, I have an AK-47 airsoft rifle that wow. I used as reference, and uh, I just I thought that I might use pieces of the of the plastic guitar, but when I stuck it next to it, and in real time, I mean, I was videotaping it, so when I stuck them next to each other, I was really looking at it, thinking, I really, I can't, I can't take apart this airsoft rifle and use it on this, partly because the pieces were so cheap and they wouldn't have lasted, and, uh, and partly because the scale was way off. If you notice, the airsoft rifle is much smaller in scale than you know all the proportions of the rifle uh, guitar. 
And I had a nice chunk of two-inch walnut, so I was like, this will make perfect grip and the perfect stock. So that's why I, I ended up just, I had the, you know, everything was kind of sitting there and worked together again. You know, it was like a perfect storm of, of junk in my vicinity <laughs> to be able to put it together, <laughs> which is usually my builds. I think uh, one of my one of my favorite builds of yours is the, um, I think you hacked apart a car. Oh, yeah, that in, was a fun In one. the alleyway <laughs> in downtown Manhattan, or yeah, right I, I around believe the block. it was Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was around the block. That was great. That, yeah, was, that, was, uh, that was fun to watch. Uh, that was a pain in the butt, that one, I'll tell you. Because um, I work in a basement. Obviously, you guys see my, my, my studio's in a bit. I'm actively looking. I, uh, part of my life is spent in upstate New York. In my, at my, I have a house in upstate New York, but it unfortunately doesn't have a good barn. It has a little garage, which is much smaller than my shop in the city, so I still always lean to my shop in the city to get everything I need done. And so we decided to build that in the, in the city shop. And uh, But the, the first part was picking the car, and the clients wanted... They basically, the, the job started out with they wanted something inside their clothing shop that people would come in and want to photograph. And they said they, they wanted like a piece that's going to be like a centerpiece of the store and a centerpiece of their brand. Yeah. And uh, So I suggested this, and they loved it. And once we started looking around for cars, I started realizing, you know, the initial thought was let's just crunch a car up. But then, of course, the, the crunch would weigh thousands of pounds. Yeah. And when you bail legitimately bail a car, the bales are like three by three feet by like nine feet long. You know, it's not it's not something that's practical. Um, yeah, it's not really like in the cartoons where it's this little thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> Richard Chamberlain, the artist that, that would do that in, in the 50s and 60s, would bail like parts of cars. And, and he had his own, you know, quote-unquote bailing machine that would take these cars and crush them. And uh, he had his own machine that would do that. And uh, so anyway, so when we got the job, we went to the junkyard and found a car with the clients. They, these guys are really cool. They have a, their shop is still very successful. It's going well. And we realized we were going to have more than enough parts to do two tables, so they decided let's do two tables. And so the simple way was to make the two hollow boxes that I created and just wrap them with the skins of the car to make it seem as though it was a bailed car. Uh, and, and a little bit lighter that way. Yeah, and much lighter, although the... the the pieces were still several hundred pounds. And if you've seen the video where I pulled them out of the sidewalk hole, the whole time we were building them, we kept checking the hole. Because uh, I don't know why. I, even though I've been in that spot for 10 years, I still don't know exactly about the size of the hole. <laughs> <laughs> I even got stuck the other day getting the cabinet out. I had to go back down the hole and then come up through the other exit, which is inside the center of the building, which I try not to do because then yeah. I interfere with the tenants. Mm -hmm. But so it was 6 couple, in the morning. A couple questions. Uh... Yeah. A couple questions from Twitter. Twitter. Uh, do you still have a bandsaw you have to start by hand? Uh, yes, I do. It's in storage. That was a uh, we. <laughs> that's so funny. When when the show Hammered came about, um, it seemed like whenever I've done a TV show, I I just don't. TV people they just don't tell the truth, and it's just no one's reliable, and nothing ever seems to really be real until the cameras are actually pointed at me. And so my brother and I just anytime. And then even when you film the show, right up until the minute you're actually looking at it on your own TV set, it could go in any direction. Yeah. Um, and so I never put, you know, I learned to not put too much faith in any of these TV conversations that happen constantly around my life. Um, so, but when we were doing Hammered, they said, okay, the show's going to happen, start collecting tools. I was like, I go, really? Okay, all right. So, you know, I said, I said to the producers, see what tools you can get pro bono from whatever companies. And, uh, and so I looked online. I always like to have unique old tools. So I looked online, and literally the minute I opened my computer, it must it was the last thing posted, the most fresh post in the free section in the Harlem School of Music. It said, uh, a bandsaw from the turn of the century, very heavy, very big, bring a lot of people. And I called the guy up, and I said, I go, did you just post this? He goes, yeah. I go, is there anybody called? He goes, no. I said, I'm going to come up and look at it right now. He said, okay, we're here. So I drove all the way up to the Harlem School of Music, which is on like 130th Street in the west side, and I backed into their uh, into their loading dock, and I walked into the building, and the bandsaw was right near the loading dock. And I was like, I go, wow, I go, this thing must weigh 2,000 pounds. He goes, probably more. He goes, it's been sitting in the same exact spot since they it was put there in like 1910. Wow. And the floor, when we moved it, when we finally moved it, the floor around it had like several layers of paint that had been painted. Like the floor had been painted maybe 30 times and that the layers were showing around the edge of the bandsaw. Wow, that's cool. 
and so we, you know, we did a lot of the old Egyptian moves. We got a bunch of steel pipes that were laying around because it was the it was the scenic department. The school used to be a theater, and so this was in the scenic department. This was one of the tools they used to use to make scenery, and uh, so uh, I ended up me and like ten guys there. They all were like all gung ho to get it out of there because they wanted the space, and they were also gung ho to see if they could tackle moving it. So it was just a it was a good combination of uh, of good timing. And we got it. We finally got it off the loading dock and into the back of my truck. But I, I, we took it apart as many pieces as we can. And then I had a Toyota Tundra at the time, and the Toyota Tundra was doing a wheelie all the way to Brooklyn. Literally, <laughs> I, it, I really thought I was going to break my back axle. I just, I did 10 miles yeah, an I mean, hour it's, all the way. It's not a one-ton truck, is it? No, no. It was just a Chevy Tundra. You know, just a you know base model, two-wheel drive, and I really felt the front end was up in the air. I was like kind of looking at the nose of my car while I was driving. And uh, anyway, I got it. I tried not to take any bumps too hard. I got it into Brooklyn, and with a, with the help of a few friends, there happened to be a giant pile of uh, of wood at the shop where we shot the TV show. So I was able to kind of push it out of the truck onto this pile of wood, and slowly like take the pieces of wood out from underneath it and stand it up. <laughs> it was uh, amazing. I didn't drop it or break it. <laughs> anyway, and now now once we had it on that the, those few episodes. I had to put it back in storage. Now I have it in storage in Long Island at my mother's garage. So that's why right now I'm looking around upstate to try and find a, a big place to grow into. Right. Ultimately, if I could, because I got so many tools in storage, I can't get that down the stairs. It was hard enough to get my Unisaw down the stairs ten years ago. I had to take the top off and break it down to its smallest pieces and get it down a set of stairs. Yeah. Oh God, I can't. I I, I dread the day I have to move out of the shop. Yeah, it's, it's easier to get them in uh, down the stairs than they are upstairs. I, uh, oh, yeah. I had a cabinet shop when I lived in Michigan, and um, we moved shops. And the, the, when I first, the first shop we moved into um, out of my dad's garage <laughs> was uh, it was just a small little building. It used to be a, a um, laundromat, and uh, actually had been all kinds of things over the years. But they had an upstairs and a downstairs, and... We just kept growing. We needed more space. So we decided, hey, this will be brilliant. We'll, we'll move all of the hardwood uh, breakdown into the basement. So we'll okay. we'll take the uh, we'll take a chop saw down there. We'll take the the uh, uh, planer and joiner and table saw down to the to the basement. They were fine getting down there, but then when we had to move a few months later, because again we ran out of space, uh, someone almost died because. Oh, <laughs> and it, that someone was me because I was behind it, yep. and we had straps and we're trying to pull it up. You know, put boards down on the stairs. We're trying to pull up the boards and the strap. I, I always loose. say stay behind oh. anything. <laughs> always. Stay. Yeah, don't stand behind it. <laughs> <laughs> always stay behind it. Always stay behind the heavy stuff going down the steps. That's what I say. <laughs> All right, another. Yeah, I, I've learned the hard way how to move heavy things. Yes, sir. Um, do you still? No, sorry. Did you finish the printing machine refurbish? Yeah, that's a good question. I saw those videos. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> talking about heavy things. Yes, I did. Oh, it right. works. Uh, it, it works. I have the rollers. I have printing blocks. And now that I have my CNC machine, the plan was to start a movie, cutting something on the CNC machine, you know, and the cutting would be of a printing block, then take that printing block and put it into the printing press and then make up a flyer or whatever it is. Because, uh, I mean, I want to show the technology of, like, very old school to very new school. So, you know, I could make, basically make a printing block on the CNC machine and print it with this antique printing press. And that's something I'm going to do as soon as the time allows. So I have that I have that all edited in my mind. I just have to create it. But, yeah, cool. it's, it's working fine. I got it now under the porch of my house in upstate New York. It's out of the rain. And uh, I keep it oiled, and it moves really nice and cleanly. I'll probably put a small motor on it when it's that time. That particular model is from 1911. Wow. And, I, and you can tell by reading the... Uh, the and did they, did they give that to you for free? No, actually, I'll tell you a funny story. My buddy uh, who lives here in the city with me, one day he said to me, he goes, hey, uh, I want to get a Chandler printing press. And I go, what is that? I never even thought about it or what it was. And he, he sent me a video of somebody using a channel printing press. I said, I go, that looks just like the thing outside the antique shop in my neighborhood and uh, <laughs> near my house in upstate New York. Uh, if anybody out there knows upstate New York, my house is in East Durham, and the town closest is a town called Cairo, 
which is spelled just like Cairo. So right at the antique shop in Cairo, there was uh, this antique printing press that had been there for the 10 years that I had been upstate. I always noticed it. And every time I drove by it, it was sitting in the, the, the rain for the entire time and um, however many years before I got there. And it was bright orange from just being completely rusty. And I thought to myself, God, what a shame, that beautiful piece of equipment. And I didn't even realize what it was until I saw the video that David sent me. And then I said, David, I know where there is one. So I went, and the place was closed. I didn't realize that it was out of business, but there was a phone number, and I called the phone number. And they were liquidating their stock, and the guy said he would sell to me. And uh, he, he firmly said, I want $400 for it. He goes, I'll get more than that for his weight and steel. So I said, I go, all right, I'll give you $400. So I took it on as a project to restore, and uh, I knew that it would be a fun adventure. That's why we began to film it for the minute I try to move it. <laughs> Did you have, you should have, I didn't film myself moving it under... Go ahead. Did you have to um, order or make any parts? Or? The single thing was there. Uh, I am missing one part. It's called the... Uh, it's something to the effect of like the standoff wheel. That big lever on yeah. the side of it. That lever is simply just to... Uh, it's called a skip, uh, a skip lever and the printing press just constantly runs, and when you push that lever, it rotates uh, an off-center axis that kicks the printing plate from kissing. So when that lever is shifted, the printing plate will just come and come close to the plate. And so this way, you're not wasting ink. You could like you know take a break, go to the bathroom if it's on a motor, for instance. And then when you pull the lever again, it closes completely. Um, so I'm just missing the connecting rod. It was never on it, but I know exactly what it looks like because. I teach at the School of Visual Arts in New York, and they have one. So I was able to go right to it and see exactly what the part looks like. So when I get to it, I could probably just weld up the part. But I could certainly print without it. So that's the good thing. That's cool. But yeah, everything was there. One part was cracked in half. I was able to, to weld it back together. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, it's amazing. Oh, things piece of machine. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I got really lucky when I found that. I mean, you know, was, the that fact that, was that literally sitting outside rusting for 10 years? The 10 years that I've seen it, it was probably out there for another 10 before me. Yeah, yeah, just sitting outside in the rain. And oh, a funny wow. bit, a, a funny moment, if you go back and look at the video, which, you know, would be interesting after I explain this part. The moment in time where um, I'm, I'm shaking the wheel, I'm, like, grabbing the wheel, and I'm, like, rocking the wheel to get the movement elsewhere. I only thought of doing that as a solution literally five minutes before I asked Taylor, my girlfriend, to videotape me. <laughs> and when things started moving, that was a real moment of time when I was excited that I was getting somewhere. Because up to that moment, I was about to give up. I couldn't get the thing to, to unfreeze. And something said to me, well, uh, uh, just a moment of inspiration. I had an old uh, tractor on the property when I bought it. And the motor was seized. And an old timer at the, down at the tractor place said to me, oh, you know how you unseize an old tractor? I go, what are you doing? You should jack the back up. And you put it in gear and you rotate the big giant wheel. And it freezes up the drivetrain and gets you, your pistons moving. And I was like, wow, that's a genius idea. So I went back and I tried it, and I could not get the tractor to, to unseize. I mean, maybe it had a broken rod or something. It would not move. And uh, anyway, I ended up giving the tractor to a friend of mine who to restore it for himself. But that little piece of information stuck in my mind, and when it came time to unfreeze the printing press, I thought of that same thought process. Let me turn the big wheel to get all the small parts moving. In, you know, instead of moving, trying to move all the small parts to get the big wheel moving. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it was a perfect solution. And, you know, it's one of those things that will stick with me forever now. Anytime I'm like, comes time to like unsee something, let's go down the drivetrain and see what's easier to turn than yeah. what we're trying to turn. Good lesson. So just, yeah, thank you. All right, so, one more uh, question for you real okay. quick. Um, Top ten tools. Top ten. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll go through the list of the top ten tools I use all the time. Yeah. Uh, my bandsaw. <laughs> my bandsaw. My table saw. I always say, like, what's the one tool you could get away with? I mean, if you had a bandsaw and a hand plane, you could probably build pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I say a bandsaw, but the table saw is obviously. Uh, I, I have a, the one I have in the city is like a little bit of like a, obviously it's like a, a model from about 67, my Unisaw, 
Um, and I've had it for about 22 years, and it's it's got a, a small horsepower motor on it because to compare to the X5 I got at my house upstate, I could push anything for the X5, and it does not slow down or whine at all. Yeah. So if uh, you know, a good new table saw. I'm thinking about getting a saw stop soon. So bandsaw, table saw, my handheld bandsaw for cutting steel. I love that thing. I use it constantly. Um of course, uh, screw guns, a good set of screw guns, uh, you know, my Veritas plane, the low angle block plane, which I use for everything. And, you know, I have long jack planes and flattening planes. I, I always end up just grabbing my little low angle Veritas plane for everything. Um, we'll get some, uh, we'll get a Scott else? McWoodworks plane into your, in your hands whenever we get to the video together. <laughs> right on, absolutely. Um, I love my uh, S-wing hammer with the leather uh, stack. That's my favorite hammer with the straight claw. I hate the curved claws; they're, they're pretty useless. Um, I gotta have a hatchet in there. Hatchet. I like the S-wing hatchet. But I prefer, <laughs> yeah, you know, or an axe, or a hatchet, or an axe. Um, I, I'm about to remod a um, a medium axe. I found this head upstate, and I got a new handle for the hickory handle. So I'm not sure if I'll make a video of it. it might be a little redundant considering I made a video of the axe already. But I have this project I want to do soon in the shop, so that's going to be my new go-to axe, my little one. Um, I always love ball-peen hammers. I use ball-peen hammers all the time. I don't know, did I say 10 yet? And a vice grip. <laughs> you, you're you're uh, a vice grip? <laughs> always need a vice grip. Needle nose, vice grip, medium size. Okay, like an 8-inch or 9-inch medium. Um, a 10-in-1 screwdriver. I use them constantly. So, being involved in the uh, in the the whole maker movement, which is really, I mean, it seems to be gaining a lot of steam and, and a lot of popularity yeah, in, in recent years. Um, well, I guess first of all, how long have you been making videos for Make Magazine? Oh well, I'll tell you a funny story about how I ended up uh, my relationship with Make began. They, um, I did the show, of course, uh, Dirty Money, uh, which mm -hmm. is online now. I, I didn't post it, but somebody posted it. The rest of fan. Thank you, the rest of the fan posted uh, all the episodes of, of Dirty Money on YouTube, but they're also on Netflix. Um, <coughs> so in the show, my license plate on my car, it really says I make. It says I-M-A-K-E. And uh, so the, the producers of the show had me sign a waiver that said that I wouldn't mind if my license plate showed to the world. I said, what do I care? Everyone can see it anyway. What difference does it make? And uh, so Joe, whose wife is one of the uh, chief editors at Make, uh, Joe Such, he, he saw the TV show and saw my license plate and said, we have to get in touch with this guy. It says his work, it says Make and his license plate. And that's how my relationship with Make started. I got a text message, uh, I got a Twitter message from uh, one of the people at Make Magazine, and I had just started using Twitter, so I really didn't know what the hell to do. And uh, it's about two or three years ago. And uh, I answered it back, and they said, hey, come to Make Affair. It's going to be in New York in the next few weeks. That was like kind of in September. And uh, so if you guys ever see the video of me at Make a Fair showing off my keys with my leather pants on, that was about 10 minutes after I met everybody at Make Magazine. They videotaped me talking about my keys. And uh, so that's where the relationship started. I had just also started making my videos at that point. That was in September of 11. And uh, they kept saying they wanted to get involved. And I think it was just a matter of money, you know, until we came to an agreement that was comfortable for them and for me. And it's not a lot of money, but... Uh, we ended up doing a contract, and uh, the contract has long been expired. But I don't say anything; they don't say anything. We just keep making videos. It's uh, it works. It's a, good. It's it's a good. lot of fun. They keep paying. Yeah, they keep paying. <laughs> good. Good. It's not That's a lot of money, but I'll tell you what: it's uh, it's 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 so much more rewarding to do those than than, than the TV shows. Honestly, because yeah. the TV shows. I mean, if a TV show came my way, of course I would do it because you know it's great exposure. Um, yeah. And there's a couple of conversations about some new TV shows, you know, all about handmade or whatever. And uh, I don't know, you know, there's been so many conversations, you get really close to the edge of like, okay, let's pull the trigger and do this, and then it doesn't go anywhere. So, yeah. you know, I just take, I take it as it comes. And, you know, if something does come and turn into something, that's great. But in the meantime, that's why I, I always have YouTube, and it's never going to go anywhere. As long as, as long as I don't go anywhere, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, uh, especially in the in the woodworking world, that, that's always it seems to be the prevailing one of the prevailing conversations uh, for woodworkers is is the age of woodworkers and uh, 
right. the there's this mindset and this mentality that that uh, woodworking is is going to die off because it's all old retired people that do woodworking. <laughs> and I've I've gotten to the point where I don't believe that anymore because um, right. I'm not an old retired guy. I, and granted, <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky I get to do this for a living. But <clears throat> um, there's a reason there's more old retired guys doing woodworking than not is because old retired guys have time and money yeah. to do woodworking. Exactly. And, yeah, exactly what if, I would say. If younger, more young guys had the time and the money to do it, they they would do it. So I think yeah. there's always going to be that influx of old retired guys, old retired guys, because there's always guys retiring. I shouldn't say just guys. I mean, there's a lot of women that do it, obviously as well. But, um, but it's got that that uh, that um, <coughs> stereotype to it, I guess is 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 what it is. Well, you know what it is. I'll tell you what it is. Like I I, I think that you know it seems like the more more fine woodworking. Um, you know, dovetails and inlays and all that kind of stuff is is more for you know uh, uh, on a day to day basis. Like what I do, like when when uh, for instance Nick often was hanging around with me one day and he says, he goes, what you do is like high end scenery work. <laughs> he goes, all the stuff you build for homes is like high end scenic work because uh, you know I'm using veneer plywoods and you know with hardwood edges and stuff. And uh, Nick Nick knows that he has the luxury to be able to take five or six months to build a table because you know he's not making a living at it. So you know the high high end joinery stuff is uh, you know it seems like it's for people that, that have like a well established either a well established thing or more time to relax you know to build that kind of stuff. Yeah. In general, you know that's a general statement. One one of the things I've been trying to, to uh, I don't know if preach is the right word but I, I've really tried to make it my mission in a way, is um, to get people off of this, there's only one way to do something. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, I get I, I get a lot of emails and stuff, you know. I, I, I'm a little apprehensive because I don't do a lot of things the traditional way. You know, I do things, you know, differently because I, I know how to do metal work, so I combine metal work with this, with that. Yeah, and, you know, it, you got a lot of the purists, you know, like, uh, you know, they nitpick and stuff, but... Yeah. You know, I don't think we have the luxury of, of nitpicking anymore. I, I think the internet is is to be thanked for that because now anybody can learn anything. Yeah. At this yeah, point. yeah, yeah. And I I look at the maker movement and, and it's something I need to get more involved in and, and get to know more of. And I'd love to make it a maker fair once or, or you know at some point. But I think that is that's the movement that's going to benefit woodworking more than anything else. I mean, that's what's going to get people involved in it. And to sit there and say, "Oh, they're they're not cutting a dovetail correctly. They're you know, they're using <laughs> they're using that tool instead of this tool." And, right, um, right. Some people get too nitpicky. It's like whatever. Yeah. And and I'm in a weird spot because I make I make high end hand tools, so I'm kind of straddled on both both lines there. Where it's like I can appreciate the high end artistic quality of of, of high end tools, but at the same time, I'm not going to crap on somebody who's who's a big fan of Buying hundred-year-old uh, Stanleys at the at at an auction and cleaning right. it up and making it work. <laughs> I think there's there has to be room for both of that, and it, yeah. it it's cool um, to see guys like you that are that are getting exposure. And I know that you don't only do woodworking, but to yeah. see that that the bandsaw come up in a lot of your videos and people that aren't reading fine woodworking magazine or popular woodworking magazine. Are still getting exposure to woodworking, it might, you know, it might catch on. It, it might just, if a few people see, I go, hey, you know, I want to get involved in that. It's great. It'll yeah. bring more people to it. So. Now I'll tell you what. I, I teach at the School of Visual Arts now for 20 years, and uh, I teach a, a multitude of, of disciplines throughout the semester. And one particular student might pick up just one aspect of what I do, and then that's all they love to do, and that's you know. I've been able to enlighten somebody in one particular aspect of something, and then they love it. And you know, this this it's a great feeling to be able to inspire somebody to just like pick up one aspect of, of woodworking, or just you know, using just the router, or just using this, or using that, or the hatchet, or the chainsaw, or whatever. You know, and uh, and uh, just talking about the maker movement, you you in, reminded me to talk about my CNC machine. I feel when I'm at Maker Fair that the world is passing me by. I walk around and see these kids, and you know, everyone's got anything, all this stuff CNC cut, and 
Many years ago, I thought about kind of opening a shop with a CNC cutter so that I could duplicate furniture designs. And uh, I went and looked at the price, and I was like, this is, you know, it's like mortgaging a house. I can't afford this. This is like <laughs> eight, nine years ago. Not to mention I need the space for a 4 by 8 machine and the, yeah, everything. So anyway, fast forward to last summer. I ended up buying the small CNC machine just to start my education on CNC routing. And it's been great. I've only, mostly only ever used it to cut out signage. And I've been able to get work with it right away. Um, you know, I made some. I've been doing a lot of stuff for the whiskey company, George Dickel Whiskey. So I'm yeah, always doing. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've been really great to me, and also Bullet Bourbon. It's the same branding company. Yeah, they've been super nice to me. So um, I've been doing some CNC stuff, signage. You know, I haven't even had a chance to do anything on the CNC that, you know, involved making. I don't know a piece of furniture. I've just been doing signage and plaques and stuff, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> And that's, you know, so far it's amazing to me. Actually, for instance, this is the keys to my shop, and you can see I see and see my name into a piece of aluminum. And that's something I couldn't have done, you know. This is just a test strip. It's amazing to me to be able to do these quick little things like this. Somewhere, somewhere on my desk I have them. Branding is one thing you're very good at. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's funny. For every, whoever's listening, when I write my book eventually, um, this is going to be inside the uh, cover of the book. I tell my students all the time uh, that if you want to look like a genius, make something big out of a lot of small things. Like, for instance, make a bridge out of pencils, and everyone's going to think you're a genius. Make a, a lamp out of a whole bunch of light bulbs, and everyone's going to think you're a genius. Or if you want to become a famous artist, just pick an image or a logo or a name and just spray paint it or write it for 25 years and then someone's going to start thinking I should start paying money for that. And so this is my own experiment to spell my name, to spare my name for as long as I can until somebody starts paying me for it. <laughs> there you go. No, but the main reason I started doing that is just because, you know, there's always the fear of losing credit for what you've done. And so mm -hmm. I just constantly brand my things. And then if you notice, my, my videos have sort of matured uh, over the last couple of years. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We uh, lost Jimmy. I will invite him back. I'm guessing he was adjusting his monitor or computer. I'm guessing he uh, disconnected something. something. <laughs> hit something he shouldn't have hit. It's that. Uh, I'm guessing he's got a Mac, and it's that magnetic uh, plug. Just he went like that, and it popped it up. Probably. <laughs> Poor design, maybe from the Apple people. <laughs> hey, it's it's. I I liked it on my old Mac. I loved it because when the kids would run around the, you have the computer sitting on your lap in the in the living room, and the kids trip over the cord. It doesn't take your computer with it. So from that perspective, it's pretty good. That is good. Well, we'll see if we can get them back. The next question for the uh, for him was. Do does he find that the TV shows hinder his ideas? Yeah. Uh, he just texted me. He said computer died. Back up ASAP. Okay. So we'll get Jimmy back in here in a second. He's fine. I'm glad we I'm glad we've got him on. It's been yeah. A good time. So. My question for him is: um, It looks like he paints all of his tools white. Or a lot of his power tools, he paints white his hand tools, and I wonder if that's because he wants to hide the brand since they're not paying him. I'm guessing it has more to do with uh, when you're on the job site. If you know what all your tools look like, no one. Would. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Dewalt sponsors him, so. Yeah. In a lot of his earlier videos, though, they were all white. I don't know if he keeps them white now. I don't know. That's a good question. He and I have talked about uh, if he's ever in the Nashville area. Um, he's going to be, but it didn't end up working out back in March. But now we're going to do a, a video on, on plane making. Cool. His style. Yeah. So, I think it's cool to see a, a like that. Come on, Jimmy. 
Well, the good news is that people don't have to look at me right now. <laughs> yeah, everyone, you have to you have to let us know if uh, if you preferred the non Matt version of which. <laughs> Where I'm just the man behind the curtain. <laughs> oh, that sucks. You see Joseph Watson's comment? He had his nephew dump his laptop and bend the wireless card, which was PCM at the CIA. That would be fun. So what's your favorite uh, the rest of the video? Um, I for some reason I really like the one where he builds the conference room table out of all the walnut strips. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then I like the other one where he does the um, oh I think it's a logo for a bank or something an install for a bank, but it's all it's a unique material like a reflective mirrored plastic. I don't yeah. Know, I don't know what it is, and that yeah. turned out that turned out pretty cool, but. Um, I don't know. I like a lot of them. When uh, you might need to send him an invite again. I don't know if, if you haven't yet. Um, when I was talking to him earlier, I, I earlier today, I let him know when Anderson, my son, was uh, in the new, still newborn, um, month or two old. I guess he's yeah. two or three months old. He uh, he wouldn't sleep real well. And so he'd be up late at night, and I, you know, Lori and I would take turns of which of us got to stay up with him. But the nights that I got to stay up with him, we just watched uh, Jimmy Duresta videos, mm. and he loved them. <laughs> so that, was, that actually may have been six months to a year. So it might it may have only been a year ago, but um, he loved watching them. So we'd just watch watch those videos over and you know, mm -hmm. go through his last couple years of videos. So I'm. Uh, Getting that kid raised right, you know, introducing all mm -hmm. that stuff early. <laughs> and I also want to find out if he actually met Katy Perry. Did you see the one thing he made? I may have missed a that one. microphone that looks like a snow cone. No, I missed that one. And it looks like he's got a picture of Katy Perry licking it. <laughs> I will have to send you a picture of that one. Joseph Watson says another good video is the Mortis Bench. I'm trying to remember that one. The Mortis Bench? So did you have a good, uh, good uh, Thanksgiving? I did. We were in eastern Washington. Ironically, I shot uh, an AK. <laughs> <laughs> I did not turn it into a into a guitar. It wasn't an AK-47, though. It was the AK-74, and we shot at exploding targets. But um, exploding had, targets. Yeah, they, when you shoot them, they explode. Um, you could light them on fire or shoot them with a pistol. And nothing would happen, uh, but if you shoot them with a high-powered rifle, they explode. We had good turkey, and it was a fun time. It was a very fun time. Yeah. You know the other video I like of him. Uh, there's one where he makes a bar at like a whiskey festival. Yeah. That's and that's kind of cool because he's he's doing a lot of handwork in a crowd. Yeah. Um. Which is yeah. Cool. I was going to ask him how much. Uh... How much free, free whiskey he gets from yeah. doing this? <laughs> yeah. Well. <clears throat> dirty money. I gotta watch all the dirty money, isn't it? Yeah, I'm gonna have to check those out now. I do not see him coming in. Oh, 
No. You just text me if we still on, so maybe try inviting him again. Maybe, maybe the in previous invite came through while he wasn't. Okay. Uh... So it's trying from new computer. Oh, that picture's funny. <laughs> Hey, you have video now. How did that happen? <laughs> just randomly it started working. I'm just glad you weren't naked or anything. Oh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> Just don't stand up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How the hell did that just all of a sudden get fixed? Seriously. Uh, it says wood chat left group chat, wood chat joined group chat. It's kind of weird. You, you, yeah, it uh, blanked out for a second, and then you were, then you were on. I'm back. I'm up. You can see my video now, right? Yeah. Okay. It's kind of crazy. Kind of crazy. I'm not sure he's going to be able to make it back. We will likely have to have him on again. Yeah. Yeah, he texted me and said he's trying for a new computer uh, a minute ago, so. We need the Jeopardy theme song. Mm -hmm. He's texting, or he's uh, sending a Hangout message on the Hangout. What? I just got a. I just got a. Uh, just got a message. I don't know why it's not working. Always good. Always fun. Fun time. Thanks, Google. Thanks for letting our friend back in. Thanks for treating our guest well, Google. You're pretty cool. Oh, he's he's uh, calling with another hangout. Um. <laughs> he started a hangout, or he's trying to hang out with you, or. Here we can we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. That's all right, man. Hey. Is this us? Uh, no, we're still on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll just hold you up to the camera. And you can keep Hey, going. what's up? Uh, um, can we have you on again? Can I call you on your telephone? I'm not sure how this works. Uh, it's another Hangout. It just uh, it rings my phone because I've got a Google phone. But Oh, so how, how would I join your thing? Because I went to, to Matt's thing and your thing, and it's not working. Uh, try going to the. Uh, you went to the wood chat page. Yeah. Hmm. And it didn't seem like you guys were live on the air. I mean, at least it wasn't showing me that. Yeah, it could be going screwy. Um. And we've we've gone out. We might just have to have you on another time. Okay. And we'll finish our uh, finish our conversation then. So it was a blast. Like we definitely want to. Seems to crash. Of course, it crashed tonight. Of course. She's just finally trying to restart right now. It happens. And now I'm, I'm on my girlfriend's computer right now. Okay. Well, yeah, if, if you're up for coming back on, we'd love to have you on again. Keep up the Any, conversation. Anytime, whatever you guys want. I mean, okay. Do you want to do it next week or in a month, whatever? Cool. If you want to come back on next week, we'll have you back on next week. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. We'll be, at least I'll be a little bit smarter with this technology. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll bring it back for uh, part two next week. So let's... let's, right, let's cool. If anybody has any questions, you know, that's listening, you can always text me or tweet me. I'll let you right back. Okay. Cool. Hey, let's spend the week Guys, letting everybody so, know that so you'll be back next really week. Very much. Okay. Yeah, Matt says we'll let we'll spend the week letting everyone know you'll be back. So we'll try and right, get cool. some more publicity on it. So excellent. Thank Thanks, man. That's it. Cool. Well, that'll be fun. We'll have we'll have uh, Chris on too uh, next week. So. 
Cool. That'll be good. That will be and good. Maybe we'll get his we'll get his input and, and see if we can get him signed up for the uh, telephone design game too. Yeah. So he'll be able to make that table in about seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it'll feel like it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, we're over time, so let's just wrap it up unless we're <clears throat> ready for Jimmy next week. Yeah. Pretty good. Hey, everybody. If you got questions for Jimmy, um, get them ready because he'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Wood chats every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific. Same bat Eastern. channel. Same bat channel. Um, maybe my camera will work for m more of the time. So, um, but other than that, I think we're gonna be we're gonna be we're gonna call it good for today, and we'll see everybody in a week. So that's Matt Gravel saying goodbye, and Mr. Scott Meek. Awesome, La Vista. And Chris will be back next week, and Jimmy will be back next week. So uh, we'll talk to you all next week, everybody. Adios. Bye-bye.